Evening, everybody. Um, my name is David Colton, um, and I am a project engineer for Patterson and Cook UK Nordic. Um, so, what I was planning on doing for this lecture is giving a brief introduction to backfill and what it is and what role it plays in the mining cycle, and then giving a brief overview of how the backfill design process um, is undertaken. Um, I've had to miss out some sections, but we'll get on to that because I could probably talk about backfill for hours. <laughs> Um, so mining is in the spotlight right now. Um, it's a hot topic, you know, five years ago and you said you're in mining, people wouldn't, would be like, oh, we're still mining. Um, there's a lot of public awareness and this is mainly due to the green transition or transition to green energy. Um, however, there is a bit of a problem, a wicked problem, one might say. Um, the low hanging fruit has already been picked. And what I mean by this is easy to access deposits of high grade or have already been mined out. This is leaving uh, new mines to be increasingly more geologically complex, um, meaning processing and extraction is more difficult. The biggest sign of this is falling head grades. And so this is a classic curve of copper head grades over the past 100 years. And we can see that it's been hitting rock bottom. <laughs> um, consequence of this, we're digging more material out of the ground for less metal. Um, leading up to this, we get a lot of waste. Mining produces a lot of waste. Um, if we consider the UK, uh, and we're not a particularly big mining com country, um, approximately 30% 30, 30 of all waste is from the mining and quarrying industry. Now, 70 billion tons of this is inert kind of waste rock, rock material from stripping uh, overburden or developmental waste. But that leaves approximately 17 billion tons of tailings waste per year. Um, why so much tailings waste? Well, if we look, if we consider the head grades again, um, and we consider to make a ton of iron, approximately four tons of tailings waste is produced. With copper, this is about 200 tons. Um, and with gold, if you're going to produce a ton of gold, quite a bit, um, you would end up with the average head grade, um, one million tons of tailings waste. Now, what can we do with this waste? Typically, it's stored in TSF facilities, which is the surface storage facilities that are dams that are encapsulated um, with clay or um, other lining materials. Um, however, there is a potential other solution. For underground operations, there are voids left after you've extracted the metal. These voids are called stokes. Um, classically, you know, in cartoons and everything, they're held up by timbers. Um, however, there is an opportunity to use a bulk product to fill this void, and this is backfilling. So the types of backfill, this can, backfill is classified into three key, key types. Um, rock fill, which is shown in the top right, is made of coarse waste rock material. So this can be from uh, developmental waste, um, it can range in size from like a, a gravel size up to meters, um, basically how big you can get in the scoop of a truck. Um, one problem with this is because you've got very bulky angular material, um, your packing is pretty poor. Um, typically, 30% of space in the stoke is left as voidage between each rock. Secondly, we have hydraulic fill um, that is shown top left. Um, what this is, is more comparable to sand, um, and it relies on water as a medium of transport. Um, taking the example of beach sand, um, the waves pick up this material, but very quickly it deposits out. The same thing occurs with hydraulic fill, and as such, that gives two complications to hydraulic fill. Firstly, you need a high energy um, turbulent flow within the pipeline as if you do not impart enough energy into the fluid, the solids will settle out and you'll block your pipeline and then there'll be a lot of angry people. Secondly, once the material is deposited in the soap, you get segregation of the, the sand sinking to the bottom and the water coming to the surface. This needs to be drained out um, and can cause issues with uh, hydraulic loading um, and increased groundwater in, in mines. The third, which is new, um, or the newer option of the two, or the three, um, is paste fill. Now, paste fill 
uh, utilizes uh, the whole tailing stream um, and effectively thickens the material beyond the point that it would naturally thicken. How do you achieve this? Um, the material is dewatered to a cake, like uh, using pressure filters or vacuum filters, and then water is added until it forms a very viscous fluid. Um, think ketchup, but you put it in the freezer and it's almost solid kind of thing. Um, the key classification about paste fill is it forms this non-segregating fluid. So if you had a mound of paste, none of the water would bleed out no matter how long you left it. Um, question that is always asked me when I can go in on site, um, how much material can we put underground? Because that's a big, big question. Um, no one likes storing tailings on surface, it's costly and there's potential environmental issues. Um, by utilizing uh, either hydraulic fill or um, paste fill, you're able to approximately put 50% of your tailings back underground, give or take, depending on how efficient your operation is. This can be improved um, further between five and 10%. Also, it depends on the grade of the ore because if you're digging up iron, then you haven't actually got that much tailings. But this is kind of a general overview. Um, an additional benefit of encapsulating the material underground is you fill up these voids that potentially have acid mine drainage um, producing minerals. Um, so we, um, and it, if you are encapsulating the tailings material with cement, you further immobilize these um, leachable metals that could otherwise cause groundwater pollution. Now, how does backfill fit into the mining cycle? Um, a lot of mines are now dependent on backfill, whether they know it or not. And a lot of them don't like that fact. It's only a topic when it goes wrong. Um, but effectively, there is a drill and blast program where a stope is taken, it is mucked out and all of the ore is extracted. Then the backfilling stages begin. Uh, a barricade is constructed. This is, can be a sophisticated spray concrete barricade or just a waste rock burn. This is to prevent the material from flowing out the slope when filling commences. Moving on to filling. Um, this is a very critical um, stage in uh, both hydraulic fill and uh, paste fill. It is perhaps the most difficult part of those uh, two stages. Um, with, a, with a rock fill, you would use um, a loader such as the one shown on the muck. And then the material is left to cure. Um, this is because it's got a cementaceous mix with it. And you don't want to be blasting next to some really soft material and have it all crumble out and dilute your ore. Now, looking at the three potential areas of backfill design, um, it is separated in, it's, it's multidisciplinary, um, but I've separated it into three key uh, engineering disciplines. Um, so the first is hydraulic engineering, and that's what we're going to be focusing on mainly for this uh, um, presentation. So this considers how easy it is to flow through uh, pipes um, and, and characterizing the material flow. Um, secondly, we have geotechnical engineering, and this is how the backfill works with the rock mass to provide support, whether that's local or regional support to prevent uh, falls of ground. And thirdly, we have process engineering. So this is considering your plant design, your control and your operation um, of your preparation plants. They're all, they're all critical, but in my eyes, uh, hydraulic engineering is more critical. <laughs> um, so looking at the process engineering overview, so this is a very high level um, view on a paste uh, plant. And so you can see that we get the tailing stream and we thicken that material and then it undergoes filtration either by vacuum filtration or pressure filtration. It is then mixed with water and binder and then delivered underground um, via pipes. This can be either gravity driven because there's a lot of head energy or pumped. Um, there's a lot to go into in process engineering, um, but we only have limited time. So I will be moving on swiftly. Um, so hydraulic engineering. the it forms the backbone of the paste system. Um, the underground pipe network is called a reticulation system. And now the purpose of the reticulation system 
is to connect the process plant or the, the uh, paste plant or the hydraulic plant on the surface to every single stope that you want to fill underground. And now this system can be immensely complicated with hundreds of kilometers of pipelines spanning across potentially two, 3,000 meters of depth. Um, and all the while, you're trying to pump a thick fluid through there, not block any lines, not blow any pipes. So it's, it's a very careful balancing act that is required. To undertake this, we produce something that is called a hydraulic grade line. Now, this is a visualization of a very complicated pipe network, and it makes it very nice and simple. Um, and we can see a lot of information from this graph. Um, so starting on the right, I don't know if I've got a cursor, but um, we have in black the pipeline profile. And so effectively, we plotted on this graph the elevation and the chainage through the pipeline in meters. And above that, we have in red and yellow um, the pipeline pressure ratings. So this is what the capacity of the system is capable of without blowing the pipes or the flanges. This is displayed in meters slurry head rather than uh, pressure such as bar. And that's so you can plot them all on the same axis. And thirdly, we have the hydraulic grade line. Now, this provides an estimate of the inline pressures within the pipeline itself. Um, so the further the distance between the pipeline and the hydraulic grade line, the higher the pressures. Um, additionally, the hydraulic grade line gives you an indication of how readily the fluid flows. A very steep uh, hydraulic grade line implies um, there's a lot of pressure loss. And so the material is very thick and difficult to pump. A flat grade line would be very thin. Um, too th thick, your pump might not have enough capacity or you might overpressurize your lines. Too thin, and we end up with a phenomenon that's called slack flow. This is where we have an excess of head energy within the uh, reticulation system. And so the reticulation system will always reach an equilibrium where at the end we are open to atmosphere, so the fluid has zero pressure. And then depending on the pressure loss of the fluid flow within the pipes, it will back up until the point when uh, there is equal head pressure to equal pressure loss. Now, above this equilibrium point, um, there is, in essence, a vacuum. So there is not a true vacuum, but it forms negative gauge pressures to the point that the fluid within um, a hydraulic fill or a pace fill vaporizes. Um, this is pretty bad because if, if we consider this image here, we have a borehole that is approximately five, 600 meters long, um, and there is free fall in the first 400 meters. Now, if you dropped a kilo weight with limited air resistance, 400 meters, you can imagine the impact that it forms when it hits this solid surface. Um, high velocity energy eats through steel pipes within hours. Um, there's also problems with cavitation as this vapor bubbles collapse. So it's, it's wanted to be avoided. Um, if you're ever in a mine and there's slack flow, you'll know about it because there'll be cannon noises and you'll hear it from hundreds of meters away and the ground will literally be shaking. Um, how can we use system monitoring to detect slack flow? Um, so with a lot of mines, there's a lot of data. Um, too much data in some cases. Um, with reticulation systems, the key thing that we are looking at is pressure gauges. And so this is pressure gauges um, on surface as well as strategically positioned throughout um, a reticulation system. Um, so I'm gonna introduce uh, a hydraulic uh, phenomenon again, which is called a transient event. Um, these are instantaneous or very fast happening uh, events that cause rapid pressure spikes or drops within a hydraulic or a pipeline. Um, the most uh, common one is you turn off the bathroom tap too, too quickly and you end up with water hammer. As the water continues to flow, but you've suddenly put a stoppage and so you get an overpressurization. In this case, when we have a piston stroke, um, there, is a, there are two pistons that act in a positive displacement pump. And the, the formula is one is moving forward while the other is pulling back and filling the chamber. 
and they are timed such that one reaches the end, the other begins. However, this timing is almost impossible to get perfectly right. And so you might have five kilometers of pace that's moving forward at two, three meters a second. And then there is a momentary gap where there is no driving. That pace isn't going to stop. It's going to keep pulling and you get this area of low pressure. Um, these areas of low pressure can be spotted on their monitoring system. So if we look at the blue line at the bottom, we have um, the pump discharge pressure. So this is located five, six meters downstream of the pump. And we can see every single piston stroke, there is a sudden transient wave and there's this sharp drop in pressure. How is this useful to us? Well, transient waves can't propagate through compressible fluids. Compressible fluids being water vapor, um, which would occur in a borehole when you get slack flow. And so in this scenario here, we can see that we're transitioning from a full flow system into a slack flow system just by looking at um, the, the, the transients across the system itself. Now we can use this to then verify our model. So if you remember back, we had that very high level analysis using that hydraulic grade line. From that, we can have a, we can produce a slack flow envelope. So that's the blue line. Um, and even though it is a very simple tool, it is an incredibly powerful tool. As you can see um, across these, I think it's 30,000 data points, it is reasonably, it provides a reasonably good estimate of when the system is operating in full, full flow versus when the system is not. Um, thirdly, this was the third discipline, engineering. We come to geotechnical engineering. So it's a common misconception that backfill holds the roof of the stope up. The orders of magnitude and strength and stiffness um, can be 10 to 100. Um, backfill typically does not get stronger than four or five megapascals, whereas you can get granites that are in excess of uh, 100. So why do we backfill then? Um, it applies two key roles here. So the first, is to provide confinement of broken rock. So this prevents movement and unraveling of the host rock itself, such that um, load transfer can be maintained through uh, that, that failed rock. Because even though it's failed, it still has significantly higher strength than the backfill itself. The second is because you've bulk filled this void, even if the backfill squishes and fails, it provides a resistance to the convergence because it has nowhere to squish to. Um, how do we define backfill strength? Backfill is uh, backfill strength is dependent on three things: the amount of water, the amount of cement, and then how long you leave it. Um, so if we look at these curves on the right, these are typical strength curves. Um, and so the less water there is, and the more cement there is, the higher strength it is. You know, if you made a very wet mortar for your house, it's not going to last a strong storm. And so there is this very peculiar balance in terms of the backfill engineering and backfill designing, where you are trying to balance um, the amount of water in the paste or the hydraulic fill such that you can deliver it all the way from surface to the stove, but also you want to reduce that amount of water because not only does it increase the amount of cement you need to add, you're adding water into voids where you want to be putting tailings. So there is this very careful balance that you have to have this multidisciplinary kind of, I don't know, a choreographed dance between them. Um, particularly um, with mines, there isn't this focus yet, but there will be, I foresee this, um, because there is always the question of how do we make it cheaper? How do we put more material underground? So typically they have one mix design across the whole mine. And so they're saying, well, okay, we'll put 5% in and that's what we'll use. Um, by adopting an individual stoke analysis, you can reduce your cement uh, binder um, 30 to 50%. Very much depends on how optimized the mine is before. Um, the knock-on effect of this is that you're reducing your cement uh, CO2 emissions because cement is a pretty, uh, influential emitter of CO2. 
Um, and then also you can reduce your unit costs of mining, which is always a good thing. People like you saving money. David, we have to close in, in about a minute. Well, so. that is perfectly okay because there is my summary. <laughs> so correctly engineered, um, you can improve your resource of your mine by supporting your regional and local geo uh, geotechnics, um, reduce the storage and surface dams, um, increase your cycle times and uh, reduce your operating costs.